We're going to start in verse 19, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Last week, we uh, studied just about uh, salvation, just about what it, what it means to the Christian, uh, knowing that you're saved, uh, knowing how that you're saved, amen. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we have to be grounded. And then also helping you to know what verses to use if you uh, lead somebody else uh, to the Lord. If you have family member that you'd like for them to be saved, uh, giving I gave you a bunch of verses last week to help you, give you a good uh, start to what to know how to lead somebody to the Lord, lead them through the Bible to help them understand those certain things. Uh, this week, let me hear uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. We're going to read it. The Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we have here, this is the great commission to the church. Jesus, this is his last words in the book of Matthew to the disciples. Uh, if you look there, verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Jesus met with them. He gave them this last commission, this last charge to the church of their mission. What were they to do? And they were to go, therefore, and teach all nations. They were supposed to go preach the gospel, uh, tell people how to be saved, tell them of what Jesus had just accomplished, how that he had come, was born of a virgin, died, a, died on the old rugged cross, shed every drop of blood he had in his body, rose from the dead three days later. He wanted them to teach all nations, teach everybody, he said, you run across. Then they were to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then they were to Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So they weren't just supposed to teach them the gospel. They were to teach the gospel. They were to preach the gospel and then baptize them. And then it didn't stop there. Then he wanted them to teach everything that he had commanded them, everything he had taught them, everything that is in this book. He wanted them to be taught. That's what the church was about. That's what church is for, teaching to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he gave them a promise, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is the great commission for the local New Testament Baptist church. We're to preach, preach the gospel, baptize the saved, and then teach them. Amen. That's uh, a three-part outline there. Amen. Yeah. Go, teach, bat, or go, baptize, and teach. Amen. Now, there's a lot of confusion, though, on this second point of baptizing. And that's what I'd like to cover tonight. Give you some scripture about what is scriptural baptism. What is it? What does it mean? If maybe you need to explain it to somebody, and maybe they don't quite understand what it is according to God's Word. Or maybe you have a question about it yourself. What is scriptural baptism? Well, we're going to go over that tonight, talk a little bit about it, um, because there's lots of confusion. There is only one way, according to the Bible, to be baptized. Only one. You can't pick and choose. Some denominations will teach that you can sprinkle. Some denominations teach that uh, you don't have to be immersed, but that you can do different ways of baptizing and, and things like that. The Bible says there's only one way to be baptized. And the Bible gives clarification that there's only one type of person that can be baptized. There's lots of confusion out there. But there's only one way to be baptized and only one type of person that should be baptized according to the Scripture, according to God's Word. Now, we are a local New Testament Baptist church. We want to follow God's Word. Amen? Are we in this to do what Pastor Haley says? No. We're in this to do what God says. Amen? So as a church, we want to follow the example given in the Bible. Amen? If it's not in the Bible, do we believe it? No. Amen? If it's in the Bible, that's what we teach and practice. Amen? So we want to follow as closely as we can according to the Scripture. So if the Scripture says it, that's what we want to adhere to. If the Scripture doesn't say it, then we stay away from it. All right? So we go there. Number one, uh, who can be baptized? Who can be baptized? Well, according to the Bible, uh, let's go Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. Who can be baptized? According to the Bible, there's only one type of person that should be baptized. 
Who is that? Well, Acts chapter 2, verse number 41 says this. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. This is talking about those that had just gotten saved at the day of Pentecost. Pre uh, Peter preached a powerful sermon, and they got saved. They accepted the Lord as their Savior. They, by faith, received the word and were baptized. Baptism followed their salvation. According to the... Well, let's go uh, Acts chapter 8, verse number 13. Let's go there. Acts chapter 8, verse number 13. Okay, let's look at the Bible. We want to do it God's way. Listen, I'm not in this to teach you how to do it Pastor Haley's way. I'm not, in there, I'm not in this to teach you how to just do the modern way. I'm in this to teach you the Bible way. What God says. What does the Scripture say? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Acts chapter 8, verse number 13. Okay, the Bible says, Then Simon himself believed also. So this man, Simon, believed, got saved, accepted Jesus as his Savior, and then, and then what? And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. So again, we see a pattern. Simon got saved and then was baptized. In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, they gladly received the word of God and then were baptized. Acts chapter 18, verse number 8. Acts chapter 18, verse number 8. Now in the Bible, the book of Acts is the beginning of the local New Testament church. Okay, this is the beginning. So this is where we want to pattern to see how Jesus commanded the church and how the church carried out his command. Acts chapter 18, verse number 8. It says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So again, we see they believed, they got saved, many of them, and then were baptized. Okay? Uh, let's see, let's go to Acts 8, verse 37 and 38. Acts chapter 8, verse number 37 and 38. It says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Let's go back actually one verse, because I want to see what he asked. Uh, this is the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip meets him, he's reading the Bible, and he asks what the, what the Bible was talking about. And Philip told him about Jesus and how he could be saved. He got saved, and then look here, verse 36, And as they went on their way... And they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So we have a question. The eunuch wants to know what would hinder him, according to the Scripture, to be baptized. He wants to know, according to God's Word, what would stop him from being able to be baptized. What does Philip say? What is the answer? It says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, Thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. The Ethiopian eunuch got saved. He put his faith and trust in Jesus for salvation. Because of that, Philip said, there's nothing that would hinder you then from being baptized. Because the only requirement for baptism is salvation. All you have to do is be saved. So the only person that can be baptized are only those that are saved. Okay? If you've accepted the Lord as your Savior, you can be baptized. If you have not been born again, if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus for salvation, then you can't be baptized. Now, you could, but would it mean anything? No. Because baptism is to follow salvation. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward experience. In the, when Christ comes in and applies the grace of God to your life, you express that to the church through baptism. It's kind of like a wedding ring. It's an uh, old uh, illustration. Many of you probably have heard it before, but uh, like a wedding ring, when I got married, the day I got married, I said to my wife, I do, and I committed to my commit. Uh, I told her I do, and I got married to her, then I put this on. Now, if I put this on before I get married, does that mean I'm married? No. What I'm, the reason I'm married is because of the day that I stood and I said, I do, to my wife. I don't have to have a ring to get married. It just tells the whole world that wants to know I'm taken. Sorry. All, uh, my wife likes it when because at work I, I deal with uh, children and deal with many, many ladies that come in. So I always make my ring very well known just 
for my wife because she likes it, or we'll be walking through the store through Walmart, and she'll look over, and she'll see somebody, and she'll say, don't look that way, and she'll take my hand and kind of mess with my ring, you know, to make it known I'm married, I'm taken. Now, I don't have to have it for that, but it's, a, it's an outward expression. It proclaims to everybody around, I am married. Baptism is the same way. It is not required for salvation. You will still spend eternity in heaven if you've never been baptized. Amen? We know that from Scripture. The thief on the cross, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. And the Lord said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Man never got saved. He died there on the cross. Or, I mean, the man never got baptized. I'm sorry. Donald's looking at me like, whoa, hold on now. Sorry. The man never got baptized. But he got saved, amen? He's in, he's in heaven tonight, amen? He's shouting with Abraham and Moses and Isaac and Jacob, but he never got baptized. But it's because baptism is not necessary for salvation. But because it does follow salvation, the requirement is, according to God's word, you have to be saved. That means that children should not be baptized until they get saved. A lot of churches will preach infant baptism. Can infants, now let's think about it, according to God's word, it's supposed to follow salvation. Can Adeline, my little nine-month-old, make a decision to trust Jesus as her Savior? No. She can't even make a decision to not poop in her own diaper. Okay? She has no clue what's going on. Okay? When I lift her up and I'm swinging her up in the air and she came back down that one day and spit all over in my wide open mouth going, ah... There is nothing worse than tasting <laughs> old formula. <laughs> but it's because she has no clue. She can't make a decision. And so God says, it's for, baptism is for those that can be saved. To be saved, you have to be willing to choose to receive by faith the gospel. Uh, receive by faith the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. A child under a certain age cannot make that decision. Therefore... A child, according to God's word, can't be baptized. Now, again, they can, but it won't, ha it won't mean anything. That's like taking your, uh, taking your daughter and putting a ring on her finger at the age of nine months. She's not going to be married. The world's going to look at you, and people are going to walk around and go, oh, that's cute, but nobody's going to think anything of it because there's no meaning to it because she has not reached that age where she can make that decision. Okay, So we rule out the infant baptism. Only an individual that gives testimony of salvation should be baptized. Amen? Now, what are the motives of baptism? Okay, so we know the members of baptism or who can be saved. What are the motives? Okay, there are some motives for baptism. Let's go to Acts chapter 10, verse number 48. In other words, why do we get baptized? Say, Brother, Brother Haley then, Pastor, what is the reason then? What, what do we do it? Well, Acts chapter 10, verse number 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. He was commanded, uh, or these people were commanded to be baptized because, not because of Paul or Peter or one of the apostles, but because Jesus gave the command to the church. Back in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, Go forth, teach all nations, and baptize. That was Jesus' command. So Jesus, way back here, gave the authority. He gave a command to the local church to baptize by immersion every individual that gets saved. Now, he didn't say every individual will get baptized that gets saved, but he said you should do your job for every person that gets saved, try to get them baptized. That was the command that he gave to the local church. We're here... 2,000 some odd years later, and we're still trying to carry on what Jesus has done, what Jesus commanded. And that command for baptism is still good for today. Jesus commands us as Christians that we should be baptized after salvation. So the authority is not my authority. It, was, it is God's authority that He gave to the local church. Now, this is why we get off into baptism from other churches. Did Jesus give the command to the Catholic Church to baptize? No. He gave it to the 11, the, the 11 disciples there. 
He gave it to those that followed him that trusted him as their Savior. To the New Testament Baptist church, John the Baptist. He gave the command to them. So that means the authority of God is with the New Testament Baptist church, but the authority of God is not with any other church that baptizes. Make sense? So your baptism from another church has no what? Authority. Kind of like this. I am the pastor now. I have been given pastoral authority. If I tell Samuel, I'm known him as Isaac, but he wants to be Samuel. If I tell Samuel to do something for me, he has my authority. So if he goes and does something and somebody says, hey, why are you doing that? Pastor told me, oh, by all means. Now, anybody else in this room, if you tell him to do that, does he have the pastoral authority? No, you are not the pastor. To have that pastoral authority has to come from me. Otherwise, it's not the right authority. Same with the president. Okay, Try to walk into the White House and uh, walk into where you know, only uh, Secret Service and all that stuff, all those people, you know, cool people, you know, with the glasses and dark, you know, and all that stuff. Try to walk into the, where employees only go or things like that. You can't, you don't have authority. Now, if the president gives you the authority, then you, by all means, because you have his authority. But if I tell you to go do it, good luck. It's like trying to walk back there at Chick-fil-A and just start working with Brother Donald. Just start, just start flipping chicken, you know. You're like, hey, I'm here for work. And you'd be like, what are you doing? You're not hired. We didn't give you the authority to work here. Now, if he signs your paper and says, you're hired, buddy, you better show up. <laughs> because you have the authority of Chick-fil-A to work there. Same with God. Christ gave the authority to the local New Testament Baptist church to baptize after salvation. Any other church that tries to take that authority, they can't because they were not given that. You have to go through the line of the church that God gave the authority to. Now, that's not my philosophy. That's God's. You say, Pastor Haley, to be honest, I don't know if I agree. That's fine. But it's not me you don't agree with. It's God. Because I've shown you the, the, the Bible. Okay, If you can show me Scripture, because I believe in the Word of God, you show me any other verse from the Bible, I'll believe you. But I have all these verses, and I want to do it God's way. Amen? That's what we believe. Now, let's keep going. The ex so we have, number one, the command of Christ, that is a motive. Also, the example of Christ. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. Jesus gave us an example. He was our perfect example how to live. We may not ever achieve perfection, amen, till we get to heaven. We'll never achieve perfection, but we should achieve to live as Christ would have us to live. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Ready? Listen. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Did Jesus need to be saved? No. So here again we know baptism is not necessary for salvation. Amen. Jesus did not need to be saved, but he wanted to show us how to fulfill all righteousness. And part of that is that first step is through salvation. That is the example that Jesus gave. Amen. Now, uh, the next motive for baptism is identification with Christ. We want also to be baptized to be identified with Jesus and what he taught. Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. 
Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. Let me turn there here. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When we get baptized, it is a picture. It is a picture of Christ's death. So you stand up straight in the water. His burial, you're immersed. And then His resurrection, you're brought back up. It is a picture of Christ, but it also identifies you with Christ. What does that identify you with? When Christ... Uh, uh, let me go back here. Romans, uh, where am I at? Romans 6, 4. Look there. When Christ was buried, it says, We are buried with Him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. So like Christ died and was buried and rose in, glory, in the glory of the Father, we, are to, uh, we also should die spiritually and, walk, and be raised and walk in newness of life. In other words, we should make a commitment. Baptism is a commitment to identify with Christ and that we should try to be a, the new creature that Christ has made us. The Bible says you're a new creature in Christ when you're saved. So that baptism identifies you with Christ and how that He was, he, he was buried, He rose, and, uh, and also should we, we, we die to ourselves daily, as Paul said, and our commitment to walk in newness of life. Because we have a new creature. That means now we should try to not walk in the old flesh, not walk in the lusts of the sins that we had before. We should try to walk in newness of life as a new creature, as a new born-again uh, saved individual with new desires. Look there, verse 5. For we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. It's not only a picture of a resurrection of a new life in you physically that you should try to walk a new life, but it's also a picture of the resurrection to come. Jesus is going to come. We're going to be resurrected and have a glorified body. Again, not necessary for salvation, but it identifies you with Christ and what He taught. And it's a commitment to walk because look, he says, even so we also should walk. Are we going to walk like we should walk all the time? No, we all fail. But it's a commitment that we should walk in newness of life. We should be different than this old world. We should be different in how we look and how we talk and how we dress and how we act. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So baptism is an outward demonstration or token of one's inner faith. It is for the Christian, it's, uh, it is a symbol merely. Not necessary for salvation, but a symbol of a new creature that is on the inside as a result of the faith, uh, of faith pro placed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, number three. The mode of baptism. Why do we baptize the way we do? Acts chapter 8, verse 38. Again, just to give you some scripture, we base it off the Bible. Acts 8, 38. It says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So we practice immersion because Acts chapter 8, 38, he went down into the water. Amen? You can't go down into the water if you're sprinkled. <laughs> You go down into it. We immerse because he went down into the water. Matthew 3, 16. You can just write these down and look at them later. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went, uh, went up straightway out of the water. He came up out of the water. Amen? You can't come up out of the water if you don't go down into it. Amen? Simple uh, uh, Einstein logic there. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We, uh, so we're buried with him. Buried. Amen. That means Christ was put under. And so we also, as a picture of Christ, are buried in baptism under the water. Mark 1, 9, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. They walked into the Jordan Ritter, 
Ritter. Wow, this is getting bad. They walked into the Jordan River, and John placed Jesus in the water and then pulled him out, and the Spirit came descending like a dove. Okay, some other verses uh, for you. Here's a good verse. If somebody tells you that baptism is required for salvation, here's a verse for you. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. It talks about how that baptism is not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Bap the filth of the flesh is sin. Baptism does not put away the filth of the flesh, but it is an answer of a good conscience toward God. 1 Peter 3, 21 is a good verse to use for you there. So, salvation makes you a part of the family of Christ, but baptism makes you a part of the church. Acts chapter 2, 41, it says that they added unto them. After they gladly received his word and were baptized, they were added to the church. Salvation makes you a part of the family of God. You are a brother and sister in Christ. You are a daughter, a daughter or son of God. Salvation places you in the family of God. Baptism places you in the church. It places you in the body of Christ. In Acts 2.41, they were gladly received his word, were baptized, and were added to the church. Amen? And so that's why. So there's some motives there. So again, you don't have to have baptism to be saved. Amen? But it is that step of growth in a Christian's life. You can never grow as you should, as God would have you to grow until you've uh, followed scriptural baptism. A pastor cannot, I could not be a pastor if I did not have a scriptural baptism because I do not have the authority of God for, uh, for this position until I've placed and submitted myself and humbled myself to baptism. So somebody else, if they were baptized into another church, they would not have God's authority, therefore they could not come and pastor this church. Amen. You could not be a deacon until scripturally baptized. God said, let everything be done decently and in order. God has an order to the Christian life. God has steps that he wants you to take. Amen. You have the first step, salvation. You get saved, faith and trust in Christ. Now you take the next step, baptism. Amen. That's that next step. Amen. It takes faith. It really does. You step in baptism, and then God has more steps. You slowly, you begin to grow. You grow in grace, as the Bible says. But an, you'll never reach your potential for God until you start back with the basics and find out, number one, am I saved? We were talking to Donald and I. People that believe in repentance, they get confused. They never grow. They never get where they need to be. Why? Because they have to keep coming back down here to step number one. Am I saved? They're trying to be up here and live the victorious Christian life, and then they come back down here, well, am I saved? And then they, you know, get some kind of assurance. They come back up here, praise the Lord, and then they sin. Well, am I really saved? Doesn't work. Amen. God wants you to have assurance. Faith and trust in Christ, that's all it is. And then you take that next step of baptism, and then you take the next step. Amen. You can try to live up here, but God will not let you go so far until you've taken care of the first steps. Amen. God wants it done in order. Amen. And that's why we do it that way. Now, there are those that do not agree. Always will be. But we're not in this to do it their way. We're in it to do it God's way. Amen. We want God's blessings. We're going to build a church God's way because it always works. Because remember, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That door will be a revolving door as long as the name Baptist and the truths of God's words are preached. People will walk in and out. But you know what? We're in it for God's blessings. Amen. That's why we want to do it. Amen. So there we go. If you have any questions on that, say, Pastor, maybe some things I don't quite understand, let me know. Put you in my office. We'll get, some, get the verses out. Get the Bible going. Amen. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, uh, Chick-fil-A, you don't know. Uh, they pull the policy and procedures out. Here we go. Let's look at it. Here we go. You know, uh, at work, if we have a question, they pull out their handbook. Pull out the handbook. Well, this is a handbook for the Christian life. We'll pull it out. We'll read it together. Study it. But we want to grow together for God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you again, Lord.